Okay, it is my pleasure to, uh, I should say, bienvenue, Alain. Merci, cher ami, merci, Marc. Mon plaisir um, to have you here. And um, as much as I'd like to try the interview in French, I'm not sure a lot of people will understand it, especially with my Quebecois French. I'm not sure they'll understand it. So we'll, we'll go with English, but maybe the next, maybe the sequel, as we say in LA. Maybe. There we go. Um, so if, if we could start by just um, briefly giving a little bit of an introduction of, of who you are, um, that'd be fantastic. And then we'll get into chatting. Uh, sure, thank you. I'm uh, delighted to be here and having a chat with you, uh, Mark. Uh, so I came to Washington, D.C. Uh, when I was 16 years old. I've been living here ever since. And I <clears throat> launched a business um, when I was 20. And I was uh, still at the university taking classes. And the range of businesses I got involved with are, you know, go from the in the apparel industry, from design, manufacturing, retailing, then moved on to to technology businesses that had to do with um, uh, telecom and internet services. Um, I launched a, a, a hedge fund um, in the late 90s and, um, and in a healthcare company. So now my, my, I spend my time on the nonprofit in the nonprofit world, which I find fascinating and more fulfilling than anything I've ever done. So, you know, it's interesting. Um, when I ask men and women the question, the men start off with what they do and the women start off with life. <laughs> so what about family? Tell us a little bit about that background. Uh, definitely. Uh, so my wife and I live in, um, on a farm in horse country, Virginia. And we moved here about five, six years ago. We have two kids, the grown kids, and our kids have three sons in combination the total. Mm -hmm. So we have three grandchildren. And um, <clears throat> so, but I, I, I came from uh, Morocco and um, been living here ever since. So that's the family in a nutshell. My, most of my family is in New York and I'm in the Washington area. You still have family in Morocco? No, no, I don't. Um, I was there last year, though, for a forum, a YPO forum meeting, and we we met in Fez, my hometown, and it was delightful to be to see how beautiful the you know they've maintained it, and it's clean and organized, and lovely people, and so so came back with a great sense of pride of about that country. That's a good feeling. That's a good. That, I could see that being a really good experience, actually. So super cool, super cool. Um, well, you're clearly a successful business person, um, diverse industries, as you said, um, but you've also been involved in impact roles with YPO and, and, and just in general. Before we delve into that a little bit deeper, can you share that infamous why? Can you share with us your why? Or, or the way I like to really ask it is, why do you do what you do? Hmm. <clears throat> you know? Everything is an extension of something else. <clears throat> but so back in uh, 2012, I'm going to start there, in YPO, I started something called the Global Impact Initiative. I approached the board with an idea that we needed to highlight members doing great things around the world. And so we could shine a light on them to, um, to inspire other members and create a multiplier effect. And that took hold. And for the last eight, nine years, it's been a wonderful experiment in, within YPO, recognize a whole lot of people, and it's become an important award within YPO. Uh, came to realize that there was a, an asset in the world that's underutilized and sitting idle, and it's called knowledge, and it's beyond the borders of YPO. It's everywhere. People have knowledge, it's not fully utilized. So, that's what led me to, it started with the, you know, identifying members within YPO, but it grew to be outside of YPO all the way to let's to develop it into a nonprofit business or, or organization so that we can capture that untapped knowledge and make it available to those who need it. So I do it because we, I think of it as, as the, uh, the Airbnb of knowledge where we're able to um, make make you know capacity available to those who who uh, who deserve it. Or I guess you could say knowledge sleeps over, <laughs> and that is 
that's why you do what you do. You're, you, you come up with these wonderful <laughs> expressions. I don't know. I just thought about it, but it's, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of cool. I mean, knowledge, the infamous line, knowledge is power, but we really need the, we really need the knowledge to be transferred. And if you sleep over, like you said, it's like the Hamburg Bee, then maybe that happens. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, we have this old adage that's that's all that's been there, saying that uh, time is money and things like that. I think of it as time is not money. Time is only money if it is providing value. So if you're sitting on your couch and you're wasting time, that's not time is money. That's wasting knowledge that people could be having and making those combinations, picking, waking up people to say, look, you know, you may have, you know, accumulated a whole lot of knowledge over your career time and all that. There is a time where it's time to give it to society or make it available to society. And what, what better privilege could that be to be invited to uh, have a legacy of putting your knowledge back into the bank, let's call it into the knowledge bank of the world. I think, you know, we just need to find a way to unlock that. Yeah, and we'll talk about it more, but I, I think it's brilliant because we, as part of a big core of our fifth element business is, is the human element and executive search. And we're very careful to talk about the difference between experiences and just experience, like years of experience. Um, you could be 100 years old, had a tremendous number of experiences or minimal, depending on if you were sitting on the couch or not. Um, although if you watch a good documentary, that might be valuable sitting on the couch. <laughs> Other than that, so so I, I get it, and I think it's a I think it's a brilliant thing, and we'll get into a little bit more. But you would, especially with your background, you would you would know this. Um, it's really taken decades. I found that corporate leaders have realized that by aligning with social and environmental impact, it actually is good for business. It's definitely good for attracting talent right now, the best talent, because they. They want to go to a place that where they can make money and do good at the same time. And so we're finally at, at, that, at that point. So with that said, as you mentioned, you were engaged in investment banking to telecom. You had the Hugo Boss, Boss brand, you know, here in the States, and, and you're involved in telecommunications and internet. When did you begin to differentiate yourself as one of those leaders who care about impact? <clears throat> um... You know, I don't know. Fr frankly, when I, when I was uh, building businesses, you know, I was minding my business and trying to build a business. You know, you get taken by the everyday pressures and all that of business. Sure. But there, there's there's got to be some permeating uh, factor about culture and and caring for the people who work with you, your team, and how you respect them, how you empower them to be to to uh, to treat their customers, uh, and so you take that value to the floor, basically, to get people to uh, be, you know, treat them well, they treat the, your, your, your customers well. That's so, yeah, it is a, it's good for business to be mindful of, of uh, the culture and the, the relationships you build. The, the, and it has to be in my mind that every relationship has a value uh, that is beyond what's good for business at that moment. It's got to be good. We have to be thinking about one big family called the world. Ultimately, if people don't think of, uh, you know, if we don't think about the world as being one, uh, there, there, there is going to be that pull to be self, self, you know, to to serve ourselves first. And it's a mentality that I think the world is at this inflection point where uh, COVID may have shown us some 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 weaknesses and certain things that we probably were doing, we felt complacent to about, with, to move forward and to, um, uh, to have that as our uh, model, to feel that the world is our responsibility, not someone else's. Yeah, it's interesting. I interviewed a, um, one of the co-founders and CEO of a company called, it's a nonprofit organization, well-funded called Planet Home. And they said, um, whatever we do, because we're called planet home, what that means we need to include everybody. It's the planet, to your point about the family type of thing. And everybody can be a solutionist in one way or another. Um, and a lot of that comes from the experiences or knowledge that they've, that they've gained. So I, th I think you're, you're clearly onto, onto something. And it kind of leads me to to another point, my grandparents were from Kiev, 
My mom was from <laughs> Kiev and my man from Kiev and told us all types of stories, but they would always say with their infamous accent, as long as you have your health, that's the most important thing. <laughs> and they would say education is close second, but the health. And it wasn't a brand, it wasn't a slogan. It was, it was for real because they knew how important it was based on their experiences. And so you mentioned COVID has been going on in the last more than a year now. Um, technological changes still happening in the speed of light, basically even the future of work is now the present of work, almost, if you will. Um, you know, we got, you got everything from, you know, snowstorms to wildfires. You got, I mean, Mother Nature's really making it happen right now. So with all that said, it's maybe a little bit of a repeat, but I want a little bit more about what triggered the amazing opportunity that you are calling the Knowledge Pledge, because you've seen a lot of people with knowledge and experience over the years. So as you said at the beginning, um, how did you put it? You know, one thing uh, signals or triggers another, if you will. So what really triggered the Knowledge Pledge? Um, I mean, you didn't need to take on another project. <laughs> no, uh, but but... You know, the, the, the backstory is that I was the chairman of the YPO Global Initiative when COVID hit. So we were, people were looking to what's next. You know, the world is changing, Alain, what's next? And so some, a member who had been recognized in the, before, Abhijit Power, who's a power partner in the Knowledge Pledge, he called me and said, so what are you thinking? What, what can we be doing? And as, as we started iterating different models and ideas save you, you know, a whole way the number of things we considered but we ended up with the knowledge pledge we're saying that there is a uh, you know bring capital is is abundant there is no need of capital in the world but people who are willing to give their time to make do something positive for the world is the the the, the, the mechanism for that may exist in the for-profit world, maybe they exist in some degree in the volunteer world, but to actually bring networks of people that, you know, are my partners and the team we've put around us have, and to bring in and really understand the questions are being that are being asked to see how we can solve them and bring people forward to to help. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's really the, the other side of it is not sharing, not giving, is as a cost. If we didn't do something today, you know, COVID woke us up, right? But if we didn't do, we we, are, we don't take it upon ourselves to do something positive with, with the knowledge that we've gained, it, it has a cost. Someone has to spend resources in order to create value for society. It's not going to happen on its own. So who better than those who have some you know, I don't know, tell me a word in Yiddish, maybe. Who, some... <laughs> Sechel, I think it's Sechel. In, uh... Sechel, well, there, there you go. <laughs> uh, who, who, have, who, have, who can actually take the time and donate it to make something uh, happen for the world. I think that's, that's the, you know, the, with Bill Gates and, and, and Warren Buffett, you know, they created something that the, the, the giving pledge, wonderful, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. And they ask people to give part of their, of their net worth to society. <clears throat> and we said, well, we can ask people to give part of their networks uh, to society. Um, it doesn't have to be capital. And in fact, when you give your time and your networks, you actually, you, you actually get to keep them. <laughs> they don't go away, it's still yours. You just made them available to others. So if someone has a, a water problem issue in, in, in Zambia and, they, and, and, they, and someone, uh, uh, with knowledge and experience can bring the, can help them scale that and make it available to other, to Southeast Asia or some other places. You know, there is the, that sharing of knowledge is, can be powerful when we need to be able to uh, unlock it. You're, you're, you're talking basically the reason for having a leaders who care um, mission, if you will, within our company and a leaders who care um, series like we're doing now. Do you find with the leaders you're talking to, the pe people you're talking to, that there has been, for lack of a better word, an awakening of, of values of what's really important? I mean, look, um, education and learning, lifelong learning, has to be for a bigger purpose than enrichment, 
and self worth, you know, it's it, there, it's kind of there in people's mind It's just opening, making it easy for them to press a button and say, I can do it. Here's a simple way to access it. Pressing the easy button is what we want to make it. Make. I think it's in people's, um, the awareness is there. It's just not simple to cross the line and say, well, I could actually jump into this project. I understand it. I know they ask. It's about, I don't know, helping them with the um, technology or marketing or financial support or scaling or cross-border partnerships, whatever it is, introductions. All of that is possible. I know how to do it. I just need to find an easy way to do that. And so we want to be press the easy button. I love the easy button, by the way. I'm going to steal that from Staples. <laughs> Their easy button. Um, it is. Um, it is where we borrowed it from. <laughs> um, you know, one of my there's different studies I've I've read, and maybe my my favorite, if you will, was a definition of um, of the thing that fills most people's hearts and souls. Aside from food and air, the thing that fills most people's hearts and souls is belonging, and I think you've given them a way where using their experiences, their, their, um, their knowledge that people, it's the old, you know, Christmas thing or Hanukkah thing where, you know, you, you, you get better feeling, you know, giving, I mean, getting than giving type of thing. Uh, no giving than getting, sorry. I'm talking mm -hmm. about, but, um, and I think um, we all want to feel part of something and we, we do, we feel it. I mean, I turned down my dream job which was for a professional hockey team to take a pay cut to go to a, a, a global leadership development nonprofit. And the only person that told me to take the nonprofit job was the one that uh, the president of the hockey team that offered me that job. And he said, he said something to the effect of life is short. You can always come back to hockey if you want, but you're going to be doing something out there. And, and you may not have that chance again. You may, who knows? And, um, and I, I really got it. From, from that point, he said, uh, you know, you, you want to, the feeling you're going to get, the knowledge you're going to get and keep, like you said, is, is amazing. So I, I think you're, you're right on the money. And um, with that said, what role do you see um, business leaders who care, if you will, playing with their talent? And, and what I mean by that is there's three aspects of well-being I usually look at. There's financial well-being. There's physical well-being and there's mental well-being, which is you know spiritual, mental, the whole the whole combination. Um, with respect to the knowledge pledge, it's kind of a leaning story. What do you what do you think business leaders who care can do to um, to show that they really care about the, all these well-beings of their talent? So I'm assuming um, you know I'm thinking about a, a enterprise leader a a C-suite person who has responsibility for a number of people and how to, and that, you know, that they would have already some precondition for giving because they, they, you rise to the top for a reason, because maybe you, you, there's humility, there's a lot of attributes that make you rise to the top, but then you have to come back and think about that and bring it back down into your organization at all levels. So that's what I would say to, for, for, for leaders is that, uh, there is the corporate PL, but then there's the personal PL. And the PL, the personal PL is different. It is about purpose and leadership and purpose or and legacy. It is that's a PL that they can promote within their organization. So they can put a line item in their own company, is the personal PL of their individuals at the uh, VP level, director level, manager level different levels in the organization. So that way it is a, it, it becomes a sense of pride that people have that their own PNL is actually increasing. I think that could be just a, a drawing card to get more people involved because it, it has to move beyond the C-suite and all over. And there is a desire, I believe in, in, in all kinds of organization, particularly the large ones. Um, all, all kinds, but that it, the signal needs to come from the top. It has to be the C-suite that says, we as an organization would like to be much more supportive of the world is one place or so. And here is a, you know, the easy button again. <laughs> Let us promote the easy button. <clears throat> and, yeah. uh, and, and 
I do, I do like that. And what's interesting about that is, and you know, this is that ends up helping the business P and L obviously. Um, and to the point of it helps the business P and L and the personal P and L by getting those experiences being out there doing what they're, what they're doing because they bring the extra knowledge and the extra feel and the extra even ability to work in different cultures um, back to, for their person, back to their family, back to their employees. And to me, it would also be, and I relate to this, our, our business again, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm Joe or Jane choosing between company A and B, let's assume the compensation is exactly the same, I'm going to likely go to with the one that cares enough about my P and personal P&L to do things like this than the other one who doesn't even mention it. I, I, I totally agree. I think it, it, it needs to, <clears throat> to be uh, displayed in many ways, the communications, uh, uh, mm, call them department communications group within big organizations uh, uh, need to be thinking about putting it out there to how they ever, however way they communicate with their, where their teams, employees to put it out there. So it becomes a part of what the, you know, the organization itself and, and We'd love nothing more than enterprises saying we can be the source of knowledge for a variety of things, provide us with a platform, the easy button so we can join on as you have projects. And so the pro bono world is an interesting world. So there's the, you know, we've looked at uh, how to best deliver our, our service, our ideas. <clears throat> And uh, with, we're saying there is a, the, the world out there who has um, the ability to provide some time on a pro bono basis. And there is probably plenty of that, a lot of volunteers. The heart in America is quite amazing. I, I've, I've always thought that when uh, there was the, um, the tsunami, I remember what year that was in 20, 2015, I don't know, some yeah. years ago. There was a, I was in the South of France, it happened, and I, they, they were showing on television a, the donations from the world, you know, to help right there. I mean, it was live and they were, there was a, a meter. America was so far above. I mean, you'd see America in the billions and you still had any other country, whether it's in the countries in the Middle East, the countries in Southeast Asia that have, have wealth. And, to help there, this was happening in Southeast Asia. And they were in the thousands or maybe in the low millions of dollars and America was already in the billions. It was unbelievable. So America America and Americans have a heart and, and they're great donors. So when we, 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 we are saying provide a little bit of your time, not your wealth, but your network, um, that should open up a lot of opportunities for people to do that and things. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And again, the training, the development, the experiences, and, and then I, I go even farther and bringing it into the community you come home to, what you've done, um, can open up someone else's eyes to do something out there. Uh, it's contagious. It's a contagious type of thing. And, and cultural. I mean, uh, contagious and cultural. If, if, the, if the CEO you know, make, makes it part of the culture, it's part of what we do, and it's part of the messaging, then it's, it, it becomes um, not only contagious, it's part of the culture, it's, it's good for business, it's good for recruitment, it's, it's, I mean, it's good for society. And it's really a mind shift that we have to accept. The world is one, and it's hard to do that. I mean, it's just, um, you know, there are forces against that. There are still boundaries, there are still geographies, there are still ethnicities, all kinds of things that are controlling the different uh, bodies in the world. It needs to just, we need to look at each other more as humanity. And by doing that, I think we help each other, ourselves. Not only that we're doing it for others, it helps us as well. Yeah, I, I totally agree. You know, I compare a lot of things to sports and once you've won a championship, once you've lost it and then won a championship, you want to win more. Once you've had the feel of meeting people from around the world and making a difference, it's like stuck in you. You want, you, you know, that feeling is big time and you want to do more. So I think you're, you're on the right track. Um, one last quick question for this, because um, I can go on for a long time in this subject. I think it's really cool. But with all that happened in 2020, and now we're in 2021, what are you most grateful for as we move forward? 
Hmm. Um, I'm, I'm grateful that I, I, I had some time to increase my personal PNL. <clears throat> really, I, I, I have, um, it, it, I don't go to the gym. I don't go to have coffee with a friend. I don't have lunches. So <laughs> all this time and that has to go someplace allowed me to um, organize a team of people who care around me and we work together the daily and not incessantly to, uh, so it, it, there's a huge sense of, of uh, fulfillment and purpose and that I feel. Well, the felicitation, I think you're doing a great job and a great thing. And uh, I definitely look forward to uh, doing some wonderful things together. So um, thank you so much for being on our Leaders Who Care series. Uh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Mark.